keeper of the cheat sheet for what the answers are. <coughs> so I hope everybody here likes sports, or a good portion of you likes sports, because this is going to be pretty sports theme. <laughs> <laughs> and all the stuff we have for um, giveaways and swags, all obviously ESPN and stuff. So. But it is kind of cool, because there are, there are four objects over there that are more collector type items. And those we're going to use uh, some trivia questions. If two people, three people know the answer, he's the judge. <laughs> Whoever answered first got it out, they win. So, um, and then what we'll do for those four, because they're all different, special, is just we'll put the four names in a hat and draw them out and then go pick whichever one you want. And then we have uh, other stuff back there you can just pick up. And uh, there's shirts, hats, coats, bottles. Things like that. Hopefully, there's enough for everyone. We have learned there's nothing you, you cannot put an ESPN logo on. <laughs> <laughs> good marketing. Good yeah, marketing. Yeah. All right. So now I got to get oriented here. So I'm trying to figure out how to use a mouse. I'm not looking at it. There you go. There we go. Boy, that doesn't look. Does that look round or does that look off of bubble? That was not one of the trivia But you got their attention. There's nothing I see people love doing for a t-shirt. It's closer and it's now pulling our order down. But I am here to tell you that innovation is alive and well at the end. That was one of the questions. Gordon had asked me. Um, he, he called me, I guess, a couple a couple months ago now, and uh, sent me an email and said, "Hey, would you like to come up here to Owen and do this lab on innovation?" And I said, "Well, send me something so I can see what you're after." And uh, and he did. And by the way, you can stop sending emails. You've made our top ten spam list. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need any more. Um, so I went through I went through this all this email to figure out what he really wanted me to answer. And I came up with I think were the four questions he asked me to answer. So I looked at them, I said, Yeah, this is easy. I said, Yeah. So he called them. I said, I'm I'll be glad to do this. And I, you know, I pulled an old nighter last week and I think I got these nailed. So let's want to go down one at a time. And I'm doing these in the context of ESPN, obviously. So um, has ESPN, Global Enterprises, outsourced technology innovation? No. <laughs> <laughs> you are an engineer. <laughs> Does a role for innovation still exist in the ESPN enterprise? Yes. <laughs> I see a pattern emerging. <laughs> At ESPN is IT where good ideas go to die? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and is IT anti-innovational at ESPN? No. no. <laughs> so I think I nailed them. <laughs> I wasn't sure what else you wanted me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Give away the prizes. Give away the prizes. <laughs> no, so there was actually one other question that was in there which wasn't meant for this day, but I thought was perhaps the most thought-provoking question, and it's, what will be the role of IT in the future? And I was saying, geez, you know, that'd be a great thing for a futurist to take a look at, and then I realized you are a futurist. And so, if this has stumped you, we're in trouble. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a great, a great question, and be a great lab sometime, perhaps, to, to go over that. Um, I happened to be, in, as was Thornton, at the, about three or four weeks ago, at the Global CIO Summit that's uh, hosted by Avanta. And we had a, um, we had a gentleman um, that did a keynote on the last day. And I figured, I don't know why I'm here. Hold on. See, you messed up my papers. I did. I did. OK, back up there. Um, and the keynote was the future of corporate IT, implications for 2013 and beyond. And the gentleman that, uh, uh, that hosted that was, um, 
David Kingston. And he's the managing director of IT practices at the Corporate Executive Board. Very controversial, and I think the only reason there may not have been a lot more uprising was it was at the end of the day, luxury prices were getting ready to give away, so people. But his last comment he made was, and it's somewhat in line with what we just heard, that 70% of the IT roles that your organizations have today will no longer be there by the end of 2013. That's a pretty dramatic um, statement. I think it's, things are obviously going to change, but I think that's, that's uh, a little more than I'm going to bite off today. But again, not a bad topic for future times. And why do I have a error thing up here? Just for the phone. It's all good. One of those jobs could be yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rough job. Don't turn your back on it. Don't turn your back on it. IT guys. Jesus. Um, but while it was out there, I also. He's a recruiter. He's got nothing to live for. It's all right. <laughs> but while it was out, out there, that I had the, um, the uh, privilege to co host a. Um, Board, a boardroom session with about 25 CEOs that was on executing innovation and delivering business impact. And so coming away from there, came, I came away with probably two basic themes coming out of there. Um, one, that IT under the guise of innovation needs to use technology to drive more efficient infrastructures and services, but also to take those um, um, initiatives and make them much closer, tied closer to the business goals. Pretty standard innovation and growth of business. The other one was so that the, as the CIOs are spending more time fostering, planning out, and putting within their budgets innovation and putting projects under innovation, the business side likes to see, since that's hard to measure, they want to see those initiatives in and they want to see an ROI coming out of those initiatives. In my mind, that's not unreasonable to expect that. If you think about what we should be doing when we're finding new solutions to put in place, is we should be able to reduce the cost. The business provide more value to the business. So what's innovation mean to you? This is just, it's kind of like cloud computing. Two years ago, you just bring 10 IT guys in a room and say, What's cloud computing? And you'll get 12 different answers. There's always a couple people that have two. Um, and it's really the same in innovation. It's different different people based on what their business drivers are, what their organizational structure is. And so none of those are wrong. Um, and all of them are right, quite frankly. So I went out and I went up to the, 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 uh, the, the internet, pulled. Is this an old one? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. Um, uh, Colby's definition fan. Um, it's an interesting. I, I don't know if. Um, go back to the papers here. Uh, is, if anyone's read The Myths of Innovation by a guy named Scott McBurkham, and he doesn't like the way we use the word innovation in our companies today. In fact, um, he is, um, he warns about the dilution of that word that we're using in our companies now. And we're saying the word innovation to do our job, just do our jobs, or at best, create a, a, a product, some product, not a great product, a product. So he, what he prefers and, and challenges, we should be reserving the word innovation for civilization changing uh, inventions, things like electricity, printing press telephone, and he actually threw in possibly the iPhone. Um, and so he, he, back in your business, he says you should ban the word innovation in your business because it is being used as nothing more than a chameleon-like word to really um, cover up the lack of substance that we have when, we, when we're putting projects out on the guys in innovation. So, I don't think it's quite that drastic. In fact, I think you know, invention and innovation are completely two different things in my mind. But for me, I put an ESPN in the middle. And I will say 
and arguably probably 100% of what we do falls under that, that definition, is we improve something that already exists in everything we do. We're not inventing things. We're not bringing in totally new functionality. Everything we've done, we've built off of something that already exists. Ah, now we get to some of the cool stuff. So I do have videos built into here. Um, and it, when I was thinking about this innovation, and I go back and I think about where ESPN came from and, and the guy that started it, uh, a guy named Bill Rasmussen and his son Scott. And it was really the brand we knew, the ESPN brand we know today grew out of a very creative, innovative idea, vision. Box. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if I didn't know better. You no, you're making your point that basically there's going to be a job for IT because it's not as <laughs> <laughs> it 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 always it's like Your subliminal yeah. message, your evil plan is working. <laughs> so, you know, in, in, I don't know how many people uh, have gone back to 1979, 1978 actually, and seen the story that came up. But, Here's a guy, he's not a technologist, he was a sports announcer and a sports writer. Then ended up getting fired by the Whalers, so he had no job for the first time in his life. But he was an avid sports fan, and he had a lot of contacts across universities and high schools within the, the New, New England area. And he wanted to, to take and put, he, wanted, he had a new vision for entertainment, and he saw this thing called cable, which was in its infancy was really going to change the way people would consume and be entertained in their homes. And he wanted to have a network focused on, on sports. His initial uh, input into this was, he was thinking 10 hours a week. Okay. What, what happened over time, when he finally went down and met RCA, I think they had just launched their, I um, uh, can't remember the name, satellite. Their first satellite went up. And they had nobody buying transponder space on it, and so they made a deal with them. It was cheaper for them to buy it 24 hours than it was for 10 hours a week. So then all of a sudden, it's a 24-hour sports network. Well, he went out and he tried to sell that idea, and he was, he was ridiculed, he was laughed at, he was joked about. Um, and this, this first clip gives you some idea of what some of that sentiment was from people he was looking to invest. It won't spend forever. <laughs> and I said, you never, never, never do this without setting everything up. Of course, I think since we rebooted, it's loading all the videos in. You're building anticipation. Can we blame it on marketing? We do that a lot. <laughs> lawyers. 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 Go lay those hands on the machine. Yeah, right. you know, magic hand. 
to be we learn. Bingo. All right. His name goes in the pot. Very good. So this is the first sports center. Just a moment, and because we've been talking about IT, and a few years ago, we actually made a change to the ESPN, and I think it's important for everybody to understand that, because a lot of what you'll hear today from me is about technology, although you'll hear the words IT in there, um, we did make a big change. So we are now today a technology division, and back in 2005, uh, when my boss retired, and I was uh, promoted into the, to the uh, head IT role, there was, our president said he wanted us, all the technology arms, to sit down together and really decide what the future of technology should look like at ESPN. And so we had the IT side of the house, which included the on-air stuff that we were doing, the bugs, the bottom lines, the pocket scores. Those were all IT applications, in-house developed systems, databases, hardware managed by IT. That's very untraditional, like any other broadcaster. Um, we had the engineering and the transmission engineering groups, and we had the new media group, which was our dot-com business that had been going on now for quite a few years. They were all three separate organizations run by different folks. Now the catalyst to do this really became the new digital center that went in in 2004. So our broadcast, I get to stand in front of that. Our broadcast, um, environment went from a pure analog plant that had been there for 35 years. I mean, this was 50-year-old technology was being used at that time. Um, very analog, all tape-based. And in the new digital center, it was computers running software, sitting on disk drives, running IP-type networks to get data to move across it. Uh, and there was what we call shadow IT being built out. So. Um, and also on the new media side, obviously, they, they had a lot of IT talent. So our recommendation in early 2006 was to form a division and to take advantage of the converging technologies, both from the infrastructure side, but also from the staff side. Huge win for my mind for the IT folks. It now gets them open the door to where they're into the, into the production side of the house and they understand what it takes to put our programming on there. They understand what it takes to move the data across networks.
So at ESPN, I, I, you know, I call it, we have two phases of innovation. We have the on-air cool stuff, which quite frankly has instant gratification. And you'll get 90 some million homes that are watching our program, and when we do something on air, they're either gonna like it or not, and with all the social tools that are out there, you're gonna know pretty quick. Um, but it is very much, this is, this is a side, we get Emmys for this type of stuff. And then we have what, what I'll call a traditional IT, which is not so cool, but I don't want you to take from that that it's not as important, or in my mind, even more important. So I want to show you a little bit about some of the cool stuff we do, because this is, this is cool stuff. Um, I'm first going to take you down to Orlando, where the new ESPN Wide World of Sports is, and we went um, live with that in late 2010. And this is where we have a huge innovation lab down there, which again is driven by our technology group. This is the ESPN Innovation Lab at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex. There's a lot of high-tech magic going on behind these doors. Technology that has and will change the way you watch and understand sports on television. Let's check out the highlights. <laughs> Gives a, an analyst the opportunity to basically draw on the screen 
spot shadows, arrows on lines. So check this out. They're actually using an iPad to control the dictations that you see on the screen. This is no joke. I'm assuming that uh, Steve Jobs approved this app, uh, or maybe they just jailbroke it. Either way, it's working. And we're going to show you a bunch of virtual stuff we're working on. You see, that, that's a real ball of relaxing. Like, yeah, the right. The iPad there, which is everything he's going to do. As she runs it, Lexi's going to kick that real ball. It now becomes a big ball. And this is our virtual playbook, where we take the players, put them on the court down in Orlando, and our talent here is using the iPad, and he's going to illustrate while he's standing out there on the court what's going to happen. We have encoders like this on this chip. And it tells you exactly where the arm is. This camera, through the encoders, goes into our system that we wrote. And we're controlling the cameras inside the EA virtual playbook uh, engine. On the air, they're using an Xbox 360, NBA 2K10 to drive the graphics. And they're using an iPad to control all the lines and triangles and bright spots that you see. It's pretty wild. And this is on TV right now. So, Aaron, you're into our largest studio. The largest. The largest one here in Bristol. What we decided in this studio when we built it was, let's give depth. Let's have a long way behind them. And we put in the big jumbo behind them. The cool thing about this studio is it's multiple studios. Right now it's set up for football. We could lift this floor up and we can make it a baseball diamond with the whole thing being right here. When we designed the facility, we wanted it to feel like a stadium. Yeah. So we made the light structure up there feel like you were in a stadium and basketball court. That's the way when you go in there, you see lights, right? So it's basically like the anchors can come in here and they're put in the game. They can relive their glory days. That's right. Yeah, that's All right, Darren. That's it. Your fantasy's over. We gotta get out of here. <laughs> Take care. I'm gonna hang around for a while and soak it in. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Appreciate it, man. So next, um, in in um, the one of those clips, you saw a virtual technology of a person appearing. And that was the technology probably about a year and a half ago. I'm going to show you what that technology is today, which is, is of much higher quality. The Orlando Magic All-Star Center joining us now via our ultimate uplink. I know what you're thinking, two things. First of all, uh, how did Dwight appear right here in the studio here in Connecticut? And second of all, if he's in Connecticut in the studio, how can he play LeBron James later on today in Orlando? Well, as I said, this is the, the debut of our ultimate uplink. He's not really here. It just looks like he's here. I can almost reach out and touch Dwight Howard. Dwight, we appreciate you yeah. hanging out with us, man. Almost. Like I said, almost. almost have a beer. Almost. <laughs> we just saw the piece on Superman. Mm -hmm. Who's the real Superman? You or Shaq? I think it's the dude from our DC comic. I, I'm pretty sure I thought he was the, the real Superman. <laughs> now, not, not, to, not to give Cisco a buzz, but this is the codex we're using, our Cisco Cell Presence Tech Codex in, in the production areas for that type of quality that we're getting. Um, next, I want to take you to uh, a product, our, our ESPN, Watch ESPN product, which we launched uh, about a year ago now, I'll give you a little bit of what's there. Michelle Beal here in a cocktail dress to tell you that ESPN has taken another giant step forward in innovation. You can be part of it. It's the Watch ESPN app. Now, with this app and with ESPNNetworks.com, our fans can watch ESPN Network live anytime, any place, on any screen. There's only two things I love more than herding cattle, and that's beans and sports. And thanks to the Watch ESPN app, I'm always connected to live games to my favorite ESPN show. The only predicament is the side one is put on. When you watch ESPN app, the ESPN network's live on your phone and tablet. <laughs> Now that's what's in front. That's what's in front. What's behind the scene on this technology is actually just absolutely fantastic. So, you know, we have to play by blackout rules. So, I'm a Cox customer and I have the ability to use Watch ESPN. So, if I'm here in Connecticut and there's a Lakers game going on, it's not going to be blocked out up here. But if I go travel and see Disney, 
and that game's blocked out. When I go on my iPad and I'm doing Watch ESPN, I'm blocked out. Because we know what IP address you have on your device, and we take those IP addresses to determine what area of the country you're in to make sure we don't violate our block out, blackout uh, restrictions. Uh, the other thing it does, globally, it starts out in the country and it will show you how many people in a country are watching Watch ESPN programming. You can drill it down to a city and get down to how many people in the city and you can get to see each individual, know what they're watching and what the bandwidth they're receiving those signals on. And it's just a fantastic uh, way to be able to ensure that we're able to provide the quality of programming that they're going to expect on these devices. So all this cool technology, you know, and then we got to get uh, the talent and the sportscasters to learn how to use it. We have to put training plans together. And sometimes it can be a challenge, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, do you know what buttons to push you? I probably don't, but I'm going to try it anyway. All right. Well, it's approach at home. Now, here's his foot landing. See it right there? Now, normally, let's stop in and go back just a touch. See, normally, uh-oh, Carl, we're going to miss okay. this one. We're going to miss this one. Normally, you would want that telestration. Shoulder in, ball goes out, everyone's happy. Fans are, look at the fans, huh? They're excited as heck. Let's get out of here. Well, let's get <laughs> No, you don't need no, 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 we'll do, we'll do big surf. <laughs> See, look, that's where you want the foot to land, right there. Now, let's go back because we have to get a little smaller with the circles. That circle right there. Clear. Circle. Clear. Right there. That's where you want the foot to land. Here's the biggest thing, though. The big circle. It doesn't matter if it lands out there because this is perfect. Those are perfect. Look at the head. The head was down on the ball. Whoa, wait, wait, we don't want to move that there. <laughs> <laughs> So then, then you have the other side of the coin where people, we love to show off our technology and the talent likes to bring people in the studios and say, hey, take a look at this. And, and every once in a while it can have a negative impact as you'll see here. Oh, check this out. This is the 3D camera. Awesome. We're messing around with it in case the show goes 3D. Step in there, check it out. Sure. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? Wow, oh, this thing's amazing. Yeah, this thing costs more than the space shuttle. Yeah, it's nice. How's this look? Sweet, man. You look real 3D. 3D's awesome. Let me see you really swing it, though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so this, this gives you this gives you a real flavor for the, the cool stuff that we do. I mean, even the 3D technology, the cameras, when George Bodenheimer announced um, two years ago out at NAD, we were going to put up a 3D network, all the technology people came back and said, okay, what's that mean? What do we have to do? And uh, you have IT people, traditional IT people are just as involved in putting that technology together as you do from the engineering side. So. Now let me head towards what I call the, the um, traditional IT. And uh, bear with me, I made some notes here. Okay, so when I, you know, again, when I talk traditional IT, I think it means different today than what it meant just a few years ago. I mean, a few years ago, traditional IT, you know, our charter was we needed to keep the servers up, we need to make sure people's applications ran, that we didn't lose their data. Uh, that the networks worked and they could get to where they needed to get to. And today, that's really, I believe, what the absolute minimum expectation for IT organizations are. You have to be at the top of your game. You have to be much, much more than that. Um, today, you have to build your networks and your infrastructures out on innovative structures that are flexible, and quite frankly, have to be able to morph over time being able to add functionality and take functionality away without having to invest the large capital investments to forklift technologies out and bring new technologies in. 
I think it also brings new meaning to a lot of words that we use today. Uh, real time, performance, um, high bill building, 24 by 7, bandwidth, even <coughs> relationships, we build relationships, and that list can go on. It really drives new meaning and new impression of what we need to do to be able to provide that level of service. I mean, you know, one word, you know, you, you look at things like today, you know, uh, hot spots, right? Uh, you know, so, <coughs> when I was in the Navy, the hot spot was to go down to the topless bar uh, <laughs> on the strip, right? Now I'm carrying it around my pocket, my phone, in my pocket, it's a hot spot. So, again, terminology changes over time the way we look at, at terminology. So, this is just a slide. There's nothing here to click to make anything work. I just threw this slide up to kind of give you some idea of what we're doing and have done in the ESPN over the last year from the more traditional off-air IT uh, technologies. And uh, Software Mall, you'll hear a little bit about Software Mall. That was a big win. Uh, we're obviously unified communications, unified um, technologies. We're working on that today. Uh, do you know Pulse? We put that in about a year ago now, or actually probably about eight months ago. And that is one of the biggest wins that we've had. A very simple transition. Um, people now are connected anytime, anyplace. Doesn't matter if you're in Starbucks, if you just got a Wi-Fi, if you're on your 3G. Uh, it's a, and you're connected to the network. No logging in necessary. It's completely secure. Um, there's one, one here, the uh, next to, under, outside of Junos there. It's a tablet. In fact, I have one running up there. And this, this is an iPad tablet. And this is something that was such a great idea that should have been made probably five years ago or three years ago. So the way our conference rooms get scheduled there or did, there's these little plastic holders or metal holders outside the door. And the assistants on the floor every morning we go print the schedule. And they go drop them in there, right? And they were good for about five minutes. And then they had no more meaning. And we looked, we, you know, we got caught up in ourselves and, and trying to do too much and figure the solution out. And we used Crestron in our conference rooms and people wanted to build a Crestron solution, which really turned out to be, a, was gonna be tens of thousands of dollars and it was going to be a crappy technology, quite frankly, used and hard to use. So I had one kid, loves to play with iPads, he said, I can just download a kiosk piece of software on here I can get you this connected live into Exchange probably in a couple hours. And so he did his demo in two hours. He was pulling up calendars live on iPads. So we polished it off, took about two weeks, and then worked with facilities, and we distributed this technology. So um, it, it's completely live. You can go and look for other days, and now you can actually go if there's an open spot. You can touch it, put in your credentials, and you can book it there on the screen. If you, want to, if you want to go into the room now. Uh, but it's a great technology. We got more feedback from our customers by, wow, this is really great, thank you. What a great idea. Something we should have thought of a long time ago. Um, another thing that we, you know, we do, and it's on Gloria, is the patching. Just the patching schedules we have to do today. I think anybody that's got Windows running, you have uh, the Flash products, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what you run today. It's very, very intense to keep up the patching schedule and to ensure that that patching is happening in machines. You do not want to do that manually. You want to find the right tools to do that, and you want to use innovative uh, ways to take that work off your back. Uh, and PDAs, you know, um, we have multiple PDAs. The, uh, bring your own device to work. We, we have that turned on now. We have five years ago. We had standards. You get one PDA, because that's what we offer. And the initial one was a trio running good technology. Um, and then at some point, somebody went to the flip phone, and that's what really started the uprising on IT, because the flip phone was really not a good technology. People that could drive around with the single keyboards and text found they couldn't do it with a flip phone, so they were getting pissed off, like, I can't drive and do this. And so uh, we had a revolt on our own. Um, what we do now, we allow multiple technologies. We've gotten out of that Gestapic mode. We used to think standards made us stronger, made us easier to support, made it a solid, solid product for people. 
but quite frankly, what in reality what it was doing, it was taking away options for the users wanted to be able to do to live in different environments. And what really drives this is the whole consumerization of technology is now starting to drive what we do in the enterprise. And so when we think about innovation, the place you can start is at Best Buy and see what they're doing down there, what people are going to be buying this Christmas to take into their homes. And that's what they're going to come in uh, you know, right after uh, uh, New Year's, and they're going to want to know, hey, when can I get this technology? By the way, let me know where I am on time, Bert. So I want to go back to two of the key questions that Gordon asked, and it is, is IT anti-innovation, and were good ideas go to die? And I said no, and that's a true statement, looking at it from the context of this definition. If you have a budget, if you're spending money and buying things, I got to say you've got to be um, innovative. I don't know, I don't believe anybody in this room has ever gone out on the street with an RFP and said, you know what, our ship runs way too fast. We need you to give us slower computers. By the way, we haven't had blue screens in a while, so we want computers to crash, kind of keep our users on our toes. That's not, that's not what you, I hope you don't, uh, go out and solicit for. You look for new technologies that are going to be the next generation. It's going to make things faster and better. Um, and, and so in that context, now perhaps the real questions to ask are these. Is IT perceived to be anti-innovation, and is there a perception or even a growing perception that IT is where good ideas go to die? I will say sometimes, yes, that is true. So it becomes all about perception in my mind. And so what drives perception? You know, you don't build relationships. You don't get out there with your customers. They, they don't know who you are. You don't have the ability. They're not going to pick up the phone and ask you something because you've never taken the time to build a relationship with them. Um, and when they do ask something, you get so tied up, you don't follow up. And that's a kiss of death. Um, you know, when I, when I put all these down there, I say, let me put them in an order of priority. There is no order of priority, quite frankly. All those can drive a negative perception, and it doesn't matter where it sits on the list. It is just as powerful as any other one. Uh, a couple of the key ones that are on here is, and I said it before, driving standards. When you have standards and you're forcing them into what you, IT, has determined is best for them, that's, that's a very negative perception. Um, poor customer support skills. There's nothing worse than to have a user call at 11 o'clock at night wanting some help, trying to get paper out to do a sale, and the guy out there, the guy or the individual on the other end of the phone had a bad day and is just snooty and snippy to him and just basically blows the person off. Okay. They're, they're our customers. We cannot allow that to happen. And from time to time it does happen. Um, I'll say living in the past, in a, in a, in a, 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 but let me, go, let me go into that one, because this is something that at ESPN, I have people on my staff that have been there for 20 to 30 years. So think about it. They're probably my senior people. They're the people that, back in the early days, designed the infrastructures, the policies, the workflows, the systems. They got patted on the back until they did a great job, and they got bonuses, they got raises, and they got promoted. Sometimes it's hard for those individuals to step outside the box and challenge what it is they built and were so proud of. And so you'll have your senior people, and I, I have it happen to my staff, where they'll look and say, well, it works fine. Why, why would we change anything? Why would we spend money on that? It works great. It's been working great for 20 years now. Well, that's why we want to take a look at it. And so we've got to get out of that mentality, and I tell them, you ask yourself the question, is why would I even consider doing it the way we do it today? Don't ask yourself, why would we change? Because you're going to come up with two completely different answers. Um, so what, what's on the positive side? Again, relationships and collaboration. Um, I think our budget and chargeback policies also affect both negative and positive. We're a centralized budget organization, um, and we do not do chargebacks. So to our customers, everything's free. When they get something, that's a positive thing. On the other hand, when they come to us and say, can you do this for us? In the old days, we used to say, sorry, we can't do that. We've got way too much our play. We don't have enough money. Instead of doing that, we need to be able to offer them choices. Say, okay, here's what it's going to cost. 
these are the four things you have on the plate right now. Do you, what one do you want to take off the plate to drive this as a higher priority for your requirements? And now you put, put it back onto the customer to look and decide what is his or her highest priority instead of IT being perceived as making that decision for them. Um, the other thing we don't do well, it's the last one on here, and that's about telling your story. You know, IT people, most of them are, they can be shy, uh, they can be uh, introverted, they can be, um, you know, not most social individuals in the world, but we don't tell, we're not good salesmen, we don't go out and tell our story. And that's one thing that over the years at ESPN we've seen, it's really hurt us. So, we actually started back about three years ago, put a campaign in place, we get to it. And um, this is, uh, this one right here, I'll pull it up. This actually is our president now, John Skipper. Um, oh, that was one of my trivia questions. Um, uh, John Skipper. But we, we had a survey. <laughs> We, uh, we had a survey done company-wide, and technology took a pretty big bang on it. I mean, we, we didn't suck to the nth degree, but when you went and read what our users were saying, we had a lot of room for improvement we need to do. So we really focused on doing that. And this is a video that, it wasn't IT that cut this video, the, the decision to cut this video really came from our user base, and I think it's pretty cool. Good afternoon. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent, though I personally have some skepticism about their innocence. In a world filled with people, Technology, all the good men and women in technology put together, I really like that. 
Um, if you notice the ESPN net bank, that was a reference to this, this tremendous fiber network that we now have running across the world. And it's, it's tens of gigs worth of bandwidth to this. And uh, you saw John Walsh, they did this uh, uh, you know, teleport him up, uh, beam me up, Scotty kind of thing. But they left his luggage there. So it needs improvement in technology. We just <laughs> FedEx that stuff overnight. Any bits and pieces that are left over, we, we just FedEx it. Um, Chuck Darrell's going to do that. So here's another one, an, another uh, video that we did to talk about using video conferencing. And let me display these. And, and this one, by the way, get our customer is again no part of the office policy being effective. Colleagues multitask, there's limited participation, and it's tough to gauge the atmosphere. But with a worldwide company like ESPN, how else are we going to communicate beyond borders without spending a ton on travel and expenses? The answer lies in video conferencing. Did you know video conferencing is available at ESPN offices in over 15 cities around the world and in dozens of other Disney offices? You can hold video conferences with multiple people or multiple offices. The choice is yours. Well, we're using them on a, on a daily basis, actually. Uh, we installed it uh, about nine months ago, and uh, we have three different staff meetings that happen on, uh, every Tuesday that include Chicago, Detroit, our office in Atlanta, San Francisco, Burbank. And uh, we've really connected a lot of our sales folks together in one room on an ongoing basis, on a weekly basis, and it's been uh, it's very healthy. Being in a regional office, um, we truly appreciate the investments that the company has made as it relates to technology. I want to ensure for my employees that they're always feeling like they're not just a small disconnected office, but we're actually part of something larger, and technology has obviously afforded us that opportunity. So if you think about it, we, we weren't doing things like this just two years ago. So we would put all that technology in and then we'd move off to the next piece and we weren't getting any credit or any, any visibility to the rest of the company as to the value of those. And so I think working with a customer and having that level of interaction, having them help tell your story is absolutely uh, essential to us as we move forward. Um, another thing we, we started doing is uh, recently is these things we call two minute drills, very short bits about something that technology has just released that we want to make people aware of. And I'll give you an example of one of those. Set someone up, dispatch, come over, and you're not using your computer and install software. We don't do that anymore. There's a hundred and some applications in there, and you can just go up now and you just download them. The only time there's any workflow is if you want something like Acrobat Pro, which is a $500 piece of software. You're going to have to pay for that. And so it'll get one electronic approval from your, from your boss to say, yep, I'm good spending 500 bucks. Uh, 
Um, but that, but that's it. It's really trimmed and simplified. It's all about five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Which one's cooler? Um, I, I'll show you this uh, the tech day one because this is something we have been doing for four years. It's been a big win. And then I'm going to show. Today, I'm here with Kurt Jezik and Kevin Trudell, who are the co-coordinators of this year's Technology Day. So for those who don't know, Kurt, can you kind of give a little overview of what Technology Day is all about and tell everyone the themes of this year? Absolutely. On Wednesday, June 20th, the referees are coming to <laughs> blow the whistle and throw the flag on any computer-related issues you may have. It's probably the most important day on the technology calendar. This is the fourth year of Tech Day, where we, the talented IT staff, come out to see you to address any computer-related issues and show you a number of new great features. Awesome. And I heard there are some great raffle prizes this year, too. Absolutely. The grand prize this year are two pairs of tickets to go see the Red Sox at Fenway Park. Can it get any better than that? <laughs> <laughs> We really focused on how we communicate, connect with um, folks all over the world with ESPN and let them know what we're doing. Uh, we have also opened up a hacker lab now where we bring people in. We have people building robots and stuff in these hacker labs that are programmed. I mean, it's just a way for technology people and customers to come in and it's just like a playground in there. So those are all some of the things that we focused on to tell our story better. Um, That's it. I did have a slide up here to show you some future stuff we're doing, but uh, I'll leave it at that. You for the future. Round of applause. Thank you. I do have to do a couple things. We only had one uh, trivia question. Um, now they're ready. Now they're ready. Yes. Does anybody know what the first live sporting event was? It was happened at 8 o'clock on September 7, 1979. What kind of an event it was? Bowling. What? Football. Not football. Bowling. Bowling. Not bowling. Horse racing. Boxing. Oh. Hockey. Car racing. No. Nope. Hey, we, we didn't have some really good um, uh, fishing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not golf. Okay, it's a white ball. Tennis. Not tennis. Not tennis. Not soccer. Ping pong. Ping pong. No, 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 It's like a big baseball. So something just real quick on that one, by the way. Bud uh, uh, Anheuser Busch was the one big advertiser we had, and they were actually. Um, the advertiser for this event, and the event was between the Milwaukee Schlitzes and the Kentucky Bourbons. So the, the producer, every time the Milwaukee Schlitzes came up, he just cringed because your butt wiper is, is the sponsor for the event. Um, who owns the ESPN today? Yes, it is. Who else? Who's the first person knows who else? 20% of ESPN is owned by another company. Do you know who it is? Pardon? CNN? No. Citibank. No. <laughs> no. Time <laughs> Warner. Microsoft. It's not a broadcaster. Buffy. They're in print. New York Times. Magazines. Time. Sports, Sports Illustrated. Illustrated. My God, no. <laughs> <laughs> He has a big house in California. Yeah, he had a very controversial house. We got a Hearst, right? Yes. Hearst Publishing. All right, all right. Lori Cohen. There we go. I got it. All right, good job. All right. They invested, they probably invested about $120 million for 20% of the ESPN that has brought them literally billions and billions of dollars into their coffers. So one more. I think I need one more. Um, who owned ESPN after Getty Oil? Getty Oil started us up, but who owned ESPN after Getty Oil? Capital Cities. Nope. And the, the, question, the trick is, is Getty Oil was bought by somebody? Exxon Mobil. <laughs> nope. 
You're closed. Starbucks. Thank you. Thank you. 